uh, live streaming. I'm going to put it in the chat. Is up on the upper left hand side. Actually, if you just click on um, uh, show subtitles, you'll see live stream. So click um, on the closed caption button. Right, closed caption. Actually, Jennifer, could you put the directions in the chat, please? Thank you. Okay, so we have live streams for, for this for all day, and um, we will be recording it shortly. Uh, the recordings will live on the website, and we'll be putting them actually right next to, on the agenda, we'll put an extra column with the link to the recording. Um, we also are getting session materials from presenters as we get them. We will put them as well on the website. You'll have to click into the session and you'll see, for example, the strategies for teaching a large enrollment course, the one from yesterday. If you click on that, you'll see at the bottom the presenter material slides there. So you'll be getting all the slides. We'll be putting all the recordings. It's going to take a little while though, unfortunately, uh, but hopefully before the end of uh, today, everything from yesterday will be up and then tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this afternoon, we will have a poster Q&A session. So if you go to the website, you'll see the list of posters. And uh, today is hosting happy hours, cultivating faculty com camaraderie during the COVID crisis and supporting student success by building a pedagogical campus communities of practice. Uh, Jessamyn Newhouse from Plattsburgh will be doing a Q&A on that during the lunch 45 minutes. So, you know, what we did yesterday was it gave everybody a little break and then um, we just did a just simple Q&A with the poster presenter. Okay, so with that said, um, please make sure to keep your microphones muted. And Carolyn, I don't see Carolyn, she stepped away for a second. Or somebody else from uh, the panel, oh, there she is. Uh, if you could let me know, would you like to have questions throughout? Would you like to wait to the end? How would you like to do that? Do you have a plan? We do. So um, we'll say that uh, if folks have any questions during or have any comments, we'd like to encourage folks to use the chat while we present. And so if there are things related to the slides that are up, um, I'll be checking the chat and sort of uh, interjecting and sort of bringing up a point that might need to be addressed. But we will have um, hopefully a really robust Q&A and uh, discussion for about a half hour at the end. So please do use the chat um, even to comment or to leave questions. Um, and just to engage in the session altogether. And um, you'll see here, uh, Anthony will mention this, but the QR code in the tiny URL so that you can have access to our slides. And I'll also paste the tiny URL right in the chat so you can click there and get access to our uh, slides. All right, thank you. And someone was asking about the poster sessions. Uh, again, it's going to be in this room. So we're just gonna be in this room all day. This is gonna be on all day, this Zoom room. And it'll just be a little after 12.30, we'll have a Q and A. Uh, and I'll put the link again to where the poster lives in the chat. You'll see, actually, just for the posters really quick, you'll see um, a link to the poster and it's in a Google Doc. So you could actually add a comment just by inserting a comment and the directions are there. Or you could just show up and ask uh, the poster presenter questions at you know, a little after 12.30. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. Oh, it's already recording. <laughs> OK, Jennifer already started. All right. All right, thanks and uh, take it away. Okay, I guess we're about to get started here, right? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for welcoming me. I mean, thank you for attending uh, this morning's workshop. Um, this conference thus far has been particularly successful. I've learned a lot of things, and I hope that you guys will learn a lot of things at our session today as well. Um, the name of our session is Black Lives Matter in School, Creating a Campus Coalition and University-Wide Movement for Racial Justice. If you look at the first slide deck that we have up there, the first slide, we have a QR code. If you take your uh, phone and take a picture of that QR code, it will give you access to the slide deck that we are, actually will be going through today. In addition to that, you can just click on that tiny URL, copy and paste that, or just click on it. And that will also give you access to today's slide deck. 
So um, thank you for um, joining us today and um, let's get it started. Apologies for my, <laughs> my clicking around. I think I've got it sorted out now. So um, we're all happy to be here today. There's four of us who are presenting today as representatives from for over a hundred students faculty and staff that comprise Black Lives Matter at school at SUNY New Paltz. Uh, I'm Carolyn Corrado and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Sociology at SUNY New Paltz. I'm Anthony Dandridge and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Black Studies at SUNY New Paltz, which is actually the second old Black Studies Department on the planet, which was established in 1969. Hi everyone, my name is Kirsten Green. I'm an associate professor in teaching and learning um, in the program for literacy and also early childhood childhood um, here at SUNY New Paltz. And I'm Jennifer Rettner. I'm a senior associate librarian at the Sojourner Truth Library at SUNY New Paltz. So before we get started, I want to spend a moment to read this acknowledgement and kind of situate us in time and space. There is a lot going on this semester. We are living through a global pandemic, an economic crisis, and a socio-political revolution, and we are each approaching this moment from a different perspective. Today, let us acknowledge the systemic racism that is present in the neoliberal heteronormative capitalist society in which we live. These racist structures extend into all aspects of higher education. Let us acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and let us acknowledge that when we are in the United States, we are on native land. The Hudson Valley is the ancestral land of the Mohicans, the people of the waters that are never still, today known as the Mohicans of the Lenape. We must acknowledge these injustices before we engage in our research and education in order to identify and fight against the oppression that these systems reproduce. We also want to take a moment to remind everyone that the movement for Black Lives is about Black Lives, and we want to honor the lives that have been lost to white supremacy. So here's a little roadmap of how our presentation is going to go today. Uh, for the first 45 minutes, we'll be presenting, but again, please do use the chat to comment on anything that we're talking about, um, to you know, uh, ask any questions that you may have uh, about something in particular. Uh, but we also will have 30 minutes at the end for a Q&A and discussion with all of us. Um, first, what we'll do is we'll be talking about the National Black Lives Matter at School organization and movement. And we'll move on then to talking about um, our particular chapter at SUNY New Paltz and give an overview of how it came to be and where we are at the moment. Um, we're going to be highlighting the weeks of action that we took in February 2020, um, which consisted of 13 events over two weeks time. And then we'll move on to talking a bit about summer 2020 and the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism that we've all been experiencing and living through and how our campus responded and how our Black Lives Matter at school chapter responded as well. We'll then discuss briefly challenges we face and that we're currently grappling with along with some reflections on our work thus far and next steps as we see them. Um, and like I mentioned, we'll end in about 30 minutes or so of Q&A or open discussion for the group. It's important for us to understand that um, to put things in a historical context. So when we start talking about the history of the Black Lives Matter at school movement, it's important for us to understand that the Black Lives Matter school movement is an extension of those acts of resistance by people of African descent, um, so not only towards marginalization, but also the enslavement. Um, so it really, in some sense, can be traced back to, at minimum, those first interactions between Europeans and Africans off the coast of West Africa, where the first in 1442, the Portuguese um, bought some slaves there. Um, then we can move on and talk about these, let's say the significance of um, 1619 when the first slaves arrived here in Africa, uh, in America. And also talking about other issues of resistance with respect to how um, African-Americans have attempted to assert their own individual agency and just resist against the acts of marginalization throughout um, uh, this racist construction that has um, 
institutionalized itself in a variety of different ways here in America. And you'll find this, you know, going on not only with respect to um, these different wars, right, that have manifest themselves here in America, but then also you'll find these things with, um, with respect to different ways in which people of African descent have really just asserted their humanity and just, um, um, at the end of the day, attempted to be humans in a very human world. In addition to the ways in which those dehumanizing aspects of the world have has marginalized. That being said, um, Black Lives Matter School in a variety of different ways started in 2016 in Seattle at the John Moore Elementary School. Um, there were a variety of different educators there that sought to wear shirts that said, Black Lives Matter, we stand together, John Muir Elementary. And we understand that there were a variety of different issues that were going on with respect to race and racism in America, not only at 2016, but America at its base is a racist nation. Um, and you can't really talk about America without understanding the significance of the enslavement of people of African descent. So in 2016, people talked about these struggles and engaged these struggles at this John Muir Elementary School um, as a response to um, different issues that were going on in the social environment at that particular time. They were uh, making same chants such as Say Her Name, um, Black Lives Matter, and other things. And at that same particular time, there was always this resistance that was going on with respect to um, individuals just being uh, threatened. The school itself was actually targeted with a bomb threat um, from white supremacists. And um, that helped you in a variety of different ways galvanize um, solidarity, um, not only within the school, but also within the community at that particular time. So therefore, um, you had these issues that were going on in, in Seattle, a lot of other um, cities throughout the nation were becoming aware of this that were going and they attempted to engage them in their own educational context. So it moved from Seattle over into uh, Philadelphia, you see a different, a variety of different things with respect to um, them having um, a caucus of workers, uh, working educators with respect to it, the different ways in which they engage racial justice in Philadelphia. Um, and they had, you know, the Black Lives Matter at school movement started to flourish in a variety of different ways. Uh, Philadelphia also had a long tradition of engaging these issues with respect to race and racism in education because um, even as early as 2005 in Philadelphia, you actually see that black history was mandated for all high school students. And that's um, particularly important because again, with respect to all of these acts of progress, there was significant resistance. And a lot of that resistance was just talking about the significance of all um, alternative um, social identities reacting to being exposed to marginalized people's lived realities. So there was a lot of resistance with respect to non-Blacks saying, well, why does my child have to take anything as it relates to learning Black history? What is the significance of that? How is that gonna make my child's um, um, growth any more better than it is currently? So you have all of these different arguments that, was going, that were going on and resisted in, in a variety of different ways. So then also at Philadelphia at that particular time, there was a huge, strong community engagement. And you also saw that community engagement that was going on in Seattle as well um, with respect to a lot of black men coming to the John Muir school, Elementary School, standing out in front of the John Muir Elementary School. There was a celebration of black space and black Anthony, people. Anthony, one minute. I got you. There was a celebration of Black space and Black people um, at that John Muir Elementary School. And in the midst of that celebration, there, um, they acknowledged the, the significance of us attempting to integrate these educational systems with a variety of different content that is really um, marginalized and um, minimize the experiences of people of African descent. So out of that, you, with, there was a development of the Black Lives Matter School, and you have four demands which really came to the forefront. Um, one of them was uh, the ending of zero tolerance as a discipline, uh, within the disciplines. 
uh, and within education as a whole, the implement the uh, implementation of Black Studies. Um, also, they needed to look towards hiring more Black teachers and uh, funding more counselors and also not cops uh, with respect to um, the different ways in which these disparities have negatively impacted, impacted people of African descent. Um, this newly formed uh, Black Lives Matter school organization had a variety of different discussions about the directions of, of the organization. And we will be engaging um, a variety of these different conversations as we move forward. So since Black Lives Matter at school initiated in the K-12 sector, it makes sense that the conversation on our campus initiated in the School of Education, where our daily work is rooted in the practice of educating the future generation of educators. In the 2017-2018 school year, my colleague Michael Smith and I started a critical pedagogy study group in the School of Education. The intent was to discuss pedagogical practice, research, and policy from a critical pedagogy lens. In February of that year, a few of us wore Black Lives Matter at school t-shirts to a School of Education faculty meeting. Um, it was a very subtle attempt at the time to begin the discussion in our school. Um, in summer 2018, I attended a conference in Chicago where I had the chance to hear Jesse Hagopian and Wayne Au speak about their organizing efforts. There are two Seattle-based educators who helped begin the Black Lives Matter at school movement in, in, nationally. Um, and during the discussion portion of their presentation, um, efforts in higher education and specifically schools of education came up. And so traveling back from that conference, definitely the wheels were turning. Um, in the following school year, we put out a call across campus for new members to join the critical pedagogy study group. Um, and Anthony joined our group from Black Studies. And I think we had one other person from across campus who studied from Art Ed, but it was a pretty small turnout. That February, members of the study group put together a small program of events on campus to align with the National Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action. Um, and we could have a whole other presentation, I think, on the, the, the lessons we learned from that experience as well. Um, in fall 2019, we decided to put out a call for a Black Lives Matter at School organizing committee across campus. Um, the Faculty Development Center was instrumental in helping get the, world, the word out. And by the winter, we were in full swing developing a plan for engaging in the National Week of Action in February 2020, and perhaps most importantly, wanted to ensure that the discussion would, would move far beyond February 2020. Um, we'll get into what happened next in the next part of our presentation. So then in February 2020, um, we had these weeks of action where we had organized as a group and started to, to kind of really gain some traction and get folks on board who wanted to be a part of um, making something tangible happen on campus, but not just a single one-off kind of event, but rather to have multiple ways to think through anti-racism on our campus and to enact it when we can. And so this was a collaborative effort of planning on the part of students, staff, faculty, librarians, as well as administration, especially for these weeks of action. Um, and so we had organized it basically around um, the National Black Lives Matter Week of Action, which was in early February. And as our planning continued, um, and as we were sort of working on this together, we realized that to get sort of um, just the one week that early February was going to be really hard, especially for students. And so we really tried to keep students at the center of this group and have them lead whenever they were willing and able. And so one of their requests, and that really made a whole lot of sense to all of us was that we not rush things and that we were really intentional about our planning and about our programming. And so we decided to add on an additional week that was just for SUNY New Paltz that was in the last week of February that included many more events. So over the course of all of this planning, um, we wound up, and, and actually just pause here for a second and say, this is a picture um, of Anthony Reed, um, who was a student at SUNY New Paltz who designed uh, shirts for the event. Um, and in the, in the end, we wound up being able to give away um, around 800 shirts, 500 shirts that the university administration was instrumental in providing uh, funding for, and then another 300 from NYSIT, uh, the New York State Teachers Union, uh, who offered funding for diversity initiatives at a meeting, and we took their offer seriously. Um, so going forward, what we wound up doing in these weeks of action uh, was to put together a program over two weeks time. The first week um, had two major events that we um, had kind of planned on being big events with large turnouts and um, kind of, you know, big lecture hall style events. And then um, in the following 
two, two weeks later in that whole week, we had an additional 11 events over the course of that week, during the day, in the evenings to try to accommodate um, different stakeholders, different folks who might wanna come, opening it up to the larger New Paltz community. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about a few of those events now. And um, the inaugural event for this um, Black History Month uh, series, Black Lives Matter Black History Month series, was um, a, an event in which was called uh, Black Struggles for Justice at SUNY New Paltz, Past, Present, and Future. Um, it's important just to put this in some historical context uh, for us to remember if people are not aware that um, Black History Month was established in February, but it was actually Negro History Week, which was established by Carter G. Woodson in 1926. And then it, re, um, it became um, Black History Month in 1976. So um, even as you look at some of the organizing around the Black Lives Matter at school movement, there was some um, debate as to whether or not um, this series of educational engagement should be located in February or not. That being said, um, at the end of the day, um, uh, February was picked and, and we actually had a variety of different um, events that were put forth for February at SUNY New Paltz. In this Black struggle for justice at SUNY New Paltz, past, present, and future, we actually had former students from the 1960s and 70s that attended SUNY New Paltz to come and present. We actually had a professor, well, a few professors from the Black Studies Department in the 1970s to come and present. We also had students, current students, who were um, members of uh, some organizations, student-led organizations on campus to come and present. And it was just really a round table for them to engage a variety of different ideas and, and also um, develop not only some historical context, but also a, develop a sense of con continuity that allowed not only the audience to understand some of these significant efforts that have been made at SUNY New Paltz and some of the, pro pro the progress as well, but also it allowed these um, panelists to get together, exchange ideas, and even after this particular panel, they um, exchange phone numbers and relationships have grown. Um, also with respect to that, as we move forward, the Black Lives Matter at School um, Collective, some of these panelists have been very, um, important parts of the development in the direction with respect to uh, the Black Lives Matter School um, Collective in terms of the ways in which we wanted to engage different issues that are going on on campus here. Um, so some of the issues that were brought up was just talking about struggles with the administration. Not only do we have struggle, struggles with administration today, they were talking about struggles with administration back then. Actually, the president of our university um, had showed up and attended this event. And um, it was actually noted by um, Dr. Edra Rodriguez that um, he was surprised to see this happening here at New Paltz today because in the 1970s, that would not have happened. And there was even um, a very clear and overt resistance to any kinds of negotiation with students about, around a variety of different issues. Um, so there were um, a, a diversity of experiences that were engaged with respect to this particular um, event that we put up there. And um, there were not only just personal experiences from students in terms of their struggles today at SUNY New Paltz, but then you had some of the elders talking also, well, you know what? I had some of those similar struggles. There was even some solutions, right, with respect to how do we get through these struggles? And, you know, uh, when, you know, you're here at New Paltz for a reason, but not just one reason. There are many reasons that you're here and get that degree. But while you are getting that degree, try to be a change agent in the process. So, you know, these, these, the dialogue was uh, particularly important and fruitful in a variety of different ways. Thanks, Anthony. 
So for um, the Black Lives Matter in schools, students and educator, student and educator reflections from the classroom, we invited four speakers who situated their knowledge and experiences in the context of educator preparation. Two of the speakers were alumni of our School of Education and spoke to not only the racism they experienced as teacher candidates of color on our campus, but to the, the deeply problematic ways in which educator preparation keeps racism exactly as it is. The other two speakers are scholars on racism in education, Brian Jones, the Assistant Director of Education at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and Bree Pickauer, Professor of Teaching and Learning at Montclair State University, created a really incredible, powerful um, panel. And I want to just read from my comments that evening that helped sort of frame um, the discussion. Part of the purpose of the session is to interrogate and push back at the ways in which the omission or suppression of facts and realities in the classroom through which we have collectively traveled leads to entire generations of people growing up with a false sense of reality, with a false sense of how everyday actions in the classroom and beyond either resist or reproduce systems of inequity and oppression. Today, we face a crisis in our country. We are in the midst of an historical moment of incredibly high racial tension. And what happens in, every, in classrooms every single day in both big and small ways means everything when it comes to shaping our future. Every book, every article, every writing assignment, math problem, science experiment, and interaction is an opportunity to shine a light on our collective reality or to continue on as business as usual. And if in the process of educating educators, we do not hit pause more often to intentionally interrogate how our policies and practices often promote segregation and racism, however explicitly or implicitly, then we will have missed an opportunity to, con to contribute to actually ending segregation and racial discrimination. As my principal, Leviah Sherman used to say when I was a teacher, um, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. At a time when 80% of the teaching workforce in America is white, the answer cannot just be to hire more teachers of color, color or hire more people whose titles have the word diversity in it. Those things must be part of the solution, but we can't stop there. We have to thoughtfully and meaningfully consider how teacher preparation is a tool of oppression in all of its forms. There is no so silver bullet, no formula for, for how to get here to there, but I firmly believe that we must um, and can figure it out together. So the panel was just incredibly wonderful. And actually we tried to recreate it this summer um, and can share that um, when we have it uh, up and edited. But it definitely initiated further threads of discussion amongst teacher candidates and faculty members in the months since. Um, Ronnie has a question in the chat saying, did we have a topic dealing with the contribution of African-Americans in all aspects of American life, like science, technology, healthcare, education, et cetera? Um, I can speak to that and just say, I don't know that we had a specific um, event that did that thing, but I think that through some of our events, those kinds of things came out. Um, sort of leads me into the next one, which is um, this uh, event called Continuing the Conversation, Anti-Racism in the Classroom. And it's a panel that I've moderated um, since the fall of 2017, and that is organized by me and um, includes multiracial kind of panel of folks. Um, so I always have sort of a, a mix of both um, BIPOC or um, uh, you know, folks of color as well as white folks on the panel, realizing that while there's much to learn, there's a lot of invisible work um, that's unpaid and um, that's often not seen by um, communities of color that gets done and that white folks also need to be a part of teaching each other and being a part of leading the way and being role models for what anti-racism looks like, especially as educators. Um, so this was no different in that we had um, a diverse panel of individuals based on race, um, not necessarily based on gender though, interestingly. And um, basically this was the first time that this was this event had been, had been sort of always billed as talking constructively about race in the classroom. And through working with the Black Lives Matter at School group, we sort of um, changed the focus onto anti-racism in the classroom uh, for this fall, or sorry, for this spring event in February and included for the first time undergraduate students. Um, so we had uh, one undergraduate and one graduate student on the panel as well. And it was really a way for us to sort of have those folks be able to talk about what their experiences have been um, in the classroom, but also then extend beyond that on campus to think about then what we can do and what are sort of action steps. And so um, while it didn't necessarily address all of those areas that African-Americans have contributed to throughout society, certainly some of that um, has come up. So for example, one person talking about um, poetry and literature and teaching those sorts of issues through black studies courses. Um, so uh, not directly, but I would say indirectly. And uh, this was a highly attended event of over 180 individuals from on campus as well as the community. 
Um, this is something where if you go back to the slides and would like to take a closer look at the numbers, just so you have a sense of how well attended things were or not in some cases, were more intimate, shall we say, um, you can take a look at this slide, but we just wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of events. Like I mentioned, there are 13 events total over the two weeks um, and how well attended they were. And you can ask any questions you have about any other ones that we're not presenting here now. Uh, the library hosted an exhibition, licensed films to be shown, and created a community curated research guide with Black Lives Matter's related content and resources, and we continue to add to that. Folks continue to submit to that. We also ran an Instagram campaign on our library Instagram um, promoting the events uh, and also giving student perspectives on the events. Jen, this is you. So summer 2020, right? We've been talking a lot about events and pedagogy and teaching and learning, right? Uh, after the murder of George Floyd in May 2020 and protests for Black Lives swept the nation, uh, I think a new urgency came to this issue, um, these issues on campus, and really started to shift uh, the focus of the group and the role of the group in some interesting and unexpected ways that we continue to try to navigate as best we can. And as it relates to the different ways in which that impacted, not just you know, the uh, 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 the society as a whole, right? But then also with respect to Black Lives Matter at New Pulse, there were a variety of different issues that we were engaging as we talked about those issues uh, that were at the um, race and pandemic forum. Um, the Blue Lives Matter sticker. Um, Kirsten, did you want to um, touch on that a little bit? Sure. So um, in March, we had had a conference on our campus um, that I had gone to go pick up the keys for at the university police um, kiosk. And on the front door was um, a Blue Lives Matter sticker. Um, or at the time, I, I wasn't totally sure. Um, I actually ended up taking a pretty deep dive into Blue Lives Matter, um, unfortunately, um, and learned lots about um, the imagery and all of that. And at the time I'd mentioned it to a couple of people and then COVID hit and everything was just a mess. Campus um, be became empty. And then we just, we raised the discussion again when we started meeting um, in May to talk about like, why does that exist? Where, what's happening? Can we get it taken down? Um, we were able to get it taken down, but in the process um, went about it in sort of like a closed door type of way. Um, and have certainly reflected on that experience. And um, since then it was a small victory for our work, but um, definitely helped us think through like the importance of transparency in the work that we do. And given the significance of police violence here in America, there are a variety of different other people who lost their lives to police violence. There was a um, SUNY um, Duchess student, chemistry student, his name was Maurice Gordon, who was murdered in May as well. And that did not get um, that much coverage. Um, so then as a result of that, there were a variety of different professors that actually attended um, Dutchess Community College, and they wanted to organize a uh, SUNY Black faculty and staff collective, well, organized um, to engage issues uh, around systemic racism and in the different ways in which it becomes institutionalized within these educational systems. And um, there was a call that was put out um, for individuals to come and get involved and show support. And um, I am currently a co-chair of the SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective. As a result, um, we have a variety of different um, demands that were actually put out there. We are actually right now in negotiations with the SUNY administration with, with, with respect to meeting many of those demands. But even since June, there have been a variety of different um, um, successes that have expressed themselves. Right? So one of them was that um, the governance structure was actually changed. Well, Governor Cuomo, he appoints a variety of different, um, I think 15 of the 18 SUNY trustees. And on um, July 23rd, um, Governor Cuomo uh, appointed 
three trustees and they are all people of color. So now we actually have um, five of the 18 uh, trustees for SUNY now being people of color as a result of these efforts by the um, SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective. Um, there are a variety of different other issues that go that we are seeking to address with, with, with respect to issues of recruitment and retainment. And uh, we have a long list of items that we will be engaging um, throughout the coming year. Um, if you wanna get access to that, I'll make sure that I'll put a link up to our website in the chat. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, over the summer, we also saw SUNY New Paltz alumni organizing in a very powerful way, uh, coming back to campus with uh, a lot to say about their own personal experiences when they were on campus and the history of um, diversity and inclusion efforts and their feelings uh, about real lack of action and real lack of change on the part of administration. Um, in the end, they brought a list of demands to the administration as alumni and about 1200 people signed on in support to that. We also saw some folks who had um, been involved in the Black Lives Matters at School Collective uh, who were all in the sciences come together and say, okay, how can we focus on this in the sciences and bring more programming and discussions specifically into our departments. So those folks came together and formed a Black Lives Matter in STEM um, group and held a series of discussions and not like like workshops uh, for faculty over the summer. Um, and over the course of the summer, one thing we haven't yet mentioned um, is that our campus actually, um, from the, the, the central administration, uh, developed a or put out a statement um, saying that there's a we are now committed to um, becoming an anti-racist institution. Um, and in the midst of, of doing that, developed a series of town halls um, that were very fraught spaces. Um, it was really important that the administration opened up space for discussion to happen. Um, and I think we've learned a lot of lessons as a campus community about um, the, the ways in which the discussion was locked down. It was sort of managed um, in a way that didn't ultimately feel like an open discussion. Okay, so we'll talk about some of the challenges that have come up. Um, right, this is a new movement, uh, a new movement, relatively new movement in our, well, I guess I won't say that on campus, right? This is the first time we're organizing for Black Lives in this formal way for most of us. Okay, so what it, you know, it hasn't been perfect. Oh, Carolyn, can you go to the next slide? I keep typing on my keyboard. So here are some of the things that um, we've been very aware of and that uh, continue to come up in conversations within the group. Okay, so we're always talking about who is at the table. Um, in terms of who is showing up to our meetings and who is signing up for our, uh, to join our listserv, um, we see that there is a consistently majority white membership in this group that is a Black Lives Matters group. Um, so one of the questions that we have and that we're constantly interrogating and trying to reflect on is why are so few black folks joining the group um, and what can we do differently to create space for black folks. Uh, also, we are, you know, in all, all of this work, uh, both in the Black Lives Matters at school, but also in our classrooms and our personal lives navigating white fragility, right? So this is something that a lot of folks started learning about over the summer. There was a big kind of spotlight shown on uh, how white fragility shows up in this work and prevents um, the work from moving forward. Uh, we're also still kind of navigating defining our role on campus. And I think that really um, became more fraught over the summer, right? As events changed and we brought, you know, people were coming to the group with uh, some sense of urgency and wanting to see actions in different ways besides holding a conference. Um, 
you know, we had to have a lot and continue to have a lot of conversations about what are we doing um, here? What is our purpose? What is our goal? And really like, what does activism look like within the institution of the college, right? Some of us have activist backgrounds, you know, outside of the institution. So we might have particular expectations and, and ways of um, wanting to navigate these. Uh, yeah, continues to be kind of a debate. And then um, the issue of accountability, right? So recognizing that at the moment we're currently majority white group, how do we center black voices in our work? How do we make sure that we're not participating in white saviorism or um, uh, performative allyship, right? So um, one way to navigate that is to be intentional about accountability and be talking about who we're accountable to in our work um, at all, all times. So we are working on building relationships with other um, collectives of Black folks who can, you know, we can go to as accountability partners. Um, and one of the, the things, I think we're going to kick it to discussion really soon, but one of the things we wanted to just mention um, that came up on our, our campus recently is um, it, it was, I think, the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, um, campus administration rolled out a plan for what they called the FAST um, response team, the First Amendment response team, which would essentially have been um, teams of people that were paired together with um, plainclothes uh, UPD, um, and then students, staff, and faculty that um, sort of self-identified and then went through some sort of vetting proper process of being like neutral. Um, and so there are many, many problems um, with this particular idea. And that what was mostly problematic with it uh, um, for us was the idea that it was being presented as part of the anti-racist um, solution for our campus. And so um, a group of us got together to, to write um, a response pretty quickly. And I just wanted to quote part of the statement um, oh, awesome, Jen. Uh, oh, I thought you were going to link this statement. We could link this statement too. Um, any anti-racist policy protocol or training developed by the administration should collaboratively consult Black members of the campus community and provide the necessary resources with which to do so. Unless anti-racist initiatives center Black voices, they risk being built on power hoarding, white supremacy, lack of transparency, transparency and fe fear or white fragility. We support the campus and the administration in continuing to resist these learned behaviors, but our first concern is that initiatives like FAST are being developed with little to no input from the communities that they claim to serve. And there has been a discussion um, to some extent, um, but what happened as a result of the, the statement was that it was it became very clear, and we hope in, in initiatives going forward, that um, best intentions without the work aren't going to, um, you know, or, or sort of events labeled as anti-racist or initiatives aren't necessarily magically anti-racist. Um, and so that's something that we're real, really still thinking about um, in our collective and on our campus. Kirsten, you're just gonna introduce this section since you're making the first point. Oh. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I don't have that in my notes. I didn't know that I was making this one. Are you sure? <laughs> We're gonna reflect. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We're gonna reflect. So sorry. Oh my gosh. Can you tell I'm also like so worried that I got my son on his uh, special this morning? He's doing kindergarten in the room next door. Anyway, it's all a mess. But um, we're going to reflect and invite your your conversation and questions. And it looks like a bunch have also developed in the chat. And so it would be great to. Um, to talk with you and hear what you have to say. I think Jen is going to say a little bit more about our reflections before we do just that. Well, let me let me add, let me help out a little bit also. So, I mean, in terms of us understanding, you know, um, those things that we have been reflecting upon, it's important for us to understand that as you do this kind of work, that um, we're not experts, right? Not, well, in some sense, not everybody, not any one person knows everything. Right. So I think that that's something that's um, particularly important well, uh, as we move forward doing anti-racist work. Right. Um, we don't want to romanticize anti-racist work. 
Um, there are a lot of struggles which have actually expressed themselves, but not only when we start talking about issues of dealing specifically to, dealing specifically with um, the Black Lives Matter and school movement, but then as we start to really even look wider in a more general sense, organizing is a difficult task. So there will be some ups and downs as we move as as we move towards you know whatever those goals and objectives that we have set for ourselves. And then also I think it's important that we don't want to minimize the importance of the work that we are doing. We have um because a lot of times you know people want change over life. And um, uh, uh, as Reverend, Reverend Al Sharpton always likes to say, if, if you think that you, you're getting into the civil rights movement and he, says, and, and he actually identifies that we are still participating in the civil rights movement. If you think that you're getting into for civil rights movement for liberation overnight, he said, get out, right? Yeah, get out because things are not gonna change immediately. So it's important for us to understand that these small things do actually have, um, um, are particularly impactful and have meaning. Uh, we've already talked about a variety of different victories that we have had with respect to the uh, B um, BLM at New Pulse Move uh, Collective um, thus far. Um, and even as of recently, remember, so this FAST initiative, this was just last month, right, that, um, the, um, that this occurred. And we stopped that, right? So um, we will always have victories, but at the same time, you always have challenges. Um, and so here are just a few questions that we are grappling with as a collective. Um, some are some big existential questions, others are more practical ones, but these are kind of like the, the questions with a capital Q. So what does it mean to be an anti-racist campus and how do we do that, right? Is it possible to do that? Can a college be uh, decolonized? How do activists work with the administration? Um, that's been particularly uh, a, a question, a more logistical one as well that we can speak to if interested. Um, how do faculty and staff navigate campus politics, um, especially given the fact that, uh, you know, not as we all know, right, there's different sorts of um, security in our jobs based on our positions. Um, and also, how do we grapple with the continued distrust between Black students and the administration that seems to keep becoming, uh, coming up in conversations at events that we're holding in the, in the chat, in the comments. Um, so these are some of the big questions that we're asking ourselves and that, um, you know, we don't have necessarily answers to just yet. And um, what we keep coming back to in this work, acknowledging that it's not perfect, acknowledging that there's no clear path forward here, acknowledging that the work will continue on past us, right, and has a long history before us. Um, one thing that Anthony and I keep coming back to in our conversations is the need for compassion uh, for each other and where we're at. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure we put that out there, right? I, I know I, for one, uh, am action oriented, you know, want movement, want to like get things forward, want to see us, you know, standing up for different things. And um, I appreciate my colleagues who have a, a long-term approach and uh, value the incremental work that is also happening with administration. So there's balance um, that we're always striving for and it requires a lot of compassion within the group and, and taking time to listen to one another. And so um, we are, I'm pretty proud of us, just three minutes past our intended uh, timeline here. And so we now have some space for some Q&A and an open discussion. And we posted the ground rules here that we abide by in our um, collective. And so to speak from our own experiences, to listen generously, to resist making assumptions, refrain from fixing or saving ourselves, each other, um, expect and accept non-closure, uh, non right? Because it's an ongoing process. To be challenged um, to disrupt racial patterns and to respect confidentiality of the stories shared here. So I, we always say like, you know, um, don't use names, right? But um, share the knowledge. So that's what we're hoping to come out of this as well. And so uh, now is it, I think would be a great, a great time for us to be able to grapple with some of the questions that were in the chat. I'm gonna paste one of them back in the chat so that my presenters can also see that I think would be a good place for us to start. Um, and I'll go back through the chat and see if there are others that have come up. Um, but if you'd like to also speak um, and voice a question or voice a comment, you just can write stack in the chat. That's how, also how we run our meetings. And then we'll keep, 
we'll keep the stack and um, we'll call on folks to be able to unmute themselves and to make a comment or ask a question. Okay, so I think it'll be great for us to start with this first one. How do we engage with non-campus individuals like parents or community members who may object to our Black Lives Matter educational efforts? Well, I'll start. Um, again, it's important for us to understand that there is no one way, right? right? There, there, there's no silver bullet to this stuff. Um, but I would like to start by saying very careful. <laughs> very careful. I think in a variety of different ways, it's important for us to understand that we need to um, not only identify the meaning that it, it might have for marginalized people, more specifically people of African descent, but then also, I also identify the meaning that these particular um, uh, uh, um, institutional engagements can have also for not only for the community, the extended community, but then also for their children as well in school. So it's important even teaching in black studies, black studies is just not for black people, right? right? Black studies is um, highlighting those contributions that black people have made to, a world, to the world in a way in which we start to understand, have a holistic understanding of who we are as, as human beings so we can move towards a more um, equitable um, uh, 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 future. I'd also add to that, um, to make space for conversation um, and also find out what are they objecting to exactly. I think that sometimes, um, the concern over having the conversation. I'm not saying this necessarily to, to about the conversation you're trying to have, but sometimes we assume it, it won't work out or it won't happen in the way that we want it to. And then the, the fear sort of prevents the conversation from starting to begin with. Um, I know just to speak from a personal perspective, um, we live in a working class district, uh, not far from SUNY New Paltz where um, there is a racial equity coalition that's beginning right now. And it's, I went to my local podiatrist to get, um, it, uh, whatever you need to know why I went to the podiatrist, but my podiatrist was just making conversation and heard the district we're in. He was like, Ooh, that place is racist. And there were some things that came out of the district recently from the high school students um, of color in particular, talking about just how racist the teachers in the district are. Um, I, there's going to be tension as that conversation um, begins to evolve, but I am making darn sure that I'm gonna get on that uh, committee, or at least I hope I'll apply. But I think look for opportunities like that too. Are the local school districts developing committees and events? Where can you have conversations with um, people that are in the campus community? Um, not sure if that totally helps, but I look forward to hearing other ideas too. Does anybody out there in the uh, audience want to chime in and say anything regarding that question? Any thoughts you have about how we can engage folks off campus who might object to Black Lives Matter educational efforts? Um, I'm also gonna put another question, I'm just gonna paste it back in the chat from another person um, because I think it goes along with this question pretty well, right? So how do we then also support um, local off-campus community in Black Lives Matter and things like accurate teaching of history. Um, and so when should or should um, SUNY, SUNY colleges or any college or university support high school teachers who are doing the work, quote unquote, um, and who are being questioned about teaching certain content as being outside perhaps the curriculum and how can we show that kind of support and how do we, how do we also, I think there's a bigger question here, which I really would love for our presenters also to talk about and just anyone else in, in this group who, um, you know, who's on the call who'd like to talk about it, is how do we continue to try to bridge the gap between like the town and gown? It's something that our group has been talking about, like how do we bridge the gaps and how do we see ourselves as part, uh, you know, as a campus, as part of a community and what is our responsibility to the local community and what's theirs to us? Um, so I think that that's sort of the underlying question as well that we might want to tackle. So I just want to chime in about a couple really amazing things that evolved over the summer, which was that we saw a lot of folks um, from the town reaching out to our group and wanting to collaborate, like the alumni, um, individuals who were 
organizing in the town um, around policing. Um, in New Paltz, there, there are like several layers of policing uh, in New Paltz. And so that was something that a lot of folks reached out to us about um, to collaborate on. But I also wanna say that um, a lot of our faculty are, are ready, and a lot of the faculty who are involved in BLMS are residents of New Paltz and are very engaged already in the school system, um, serve on the school board, are, have been on different committees um, in the community. And so I think we've already started to build those bridges and communication, um, you know, we were able to flood, like open communication pretty easily there. Anyone else? Yeah, I, th I do think that it's important for us to build those bridges, as, as Jennifer was saying, like you build those bridges, not walls, right? And um, just as, as we start to look at the different ways in which um, people of African descent have engaged um, these institutions of higher learning, they've always transcended those borders between the college and the community in a variety of different ways, right? With respect to not only um, having, let's say events to where as though you can invite community members to, participate in those events, right? But then also um, allowing students and teachers to go out to the community and teach at different library functions, show support in ways in which there were a variety of different um, uh, protests that were going on in the surrounding community that were not centered on the campus where students showed up to and contributed to, faculty members showed up to and contributed to, different things like that. And in addition to, um, Jennifer even started um, mentioning the fact that we have had community members contribute to the Black Lives Matter and School Collective um, and in concert with the ways in which we understand it, um, that we don't want to romanticize this work, that can bring about its own particular challenges as well, right? So now you bring people in and they might come in with different kinds of agendas, different kinds of strategies that you might not be aware of previously that in some sense might um, um, create some kinds of, you know, just conflict, right? As it relates to how should we go forward? Is this going to, um, is this the best way for us to move forward? And in any organization, you will, you will have people that will join, or join that organization and leave. And that's just the reality of our situation. We have had people join not only within in the college, but then also community members join and leave. And it's important for us to just uh, really be frank with respect to that. I think one more thing I'll add is that um, we we're, we still feel like we're very nascent. We still feel like we're very much a developing uh, group and that we're going through some growing pains as happens. Um, and I think that Part of that is like, so while we have some, especially I'm thinking of a few faculty members who are quite involved in the local community, both um, through like community organizations that are pushing back against some of the policing issues, but also some other folks who are involved in the K through 12 schools and some of their anti-racist initiatives at those schools, we're starting to see like a bridge being built. And so we're not at the point yet where those bridges exist. Uh, those bridges are, I think, being constructed. And while they're being constructed, they're, they're sort of being talked about and what is our role. And so we are still sort of in that fuzzy moment of figuring out how do you build those bridges? What's the extent that that bridge can be there? Um, what could it look like? What should it look like? Those sorts of things. And so um, the great part about it is that the, the lines of communication between some of the community entities and the schools, um, the local schools are opened up in a way that maybe wasn't possible necessarily in the past in the same kind of way. And that, um, you know, like I said, this is still something that's developing on our campus. We've had some successes that we can point to, but yet we also talk about our challenges and the fact that we're not, you know, sort of settled ever. And I think that's probably a healthy place to be is that we're never sort of feeling like we are finished. We are a complete group, right? So um, that's also, I think, a part of that figuring out that community involvement piece and how we can support things happening locally is also kind of still figuring out what are the possibilities and also who we are and how that evolves will depend on what we can do. Um, 
There were some questions, uh, there's a couple, but one was just what are our plans for February 2021 programming so far? Um, and, and how, I, I think that I, I'll just also attack on since I obviously have some inside knowledge. Um, we'll also say, you know, what, uh, how have we been managing in the era of COVID where we can't meet in person anymore? And how has that also impacted planning and group development, but also then think ahead to February, 2021, if anyone wants to tackle that. And well, as it relates to uh, February, 2021 thus far, we are actually really just in the nascent stages of developing programming for that. We definitely do want to have um, significant programming in the same way that we did in the past. But um, also it's important for us to understand that uh, so SUNY New Pulse, uh, Black Lives Matter at um, New Pulse is, is an extension of the national Black Lives Matter at, at school movement. And um, they actually have what is called a year of purpose. As of this September, I think it was September, um, they developed a year of purpose and they have different um, objectives that they would like um, the Black Lives Matter school educational um, organizations to contribute to um, throughout the year. So every month there's a different thing, right? Um, but again, with respect to us understanding COVID, um, different workloads for different individuals, you know, all of these different things, those are, um, it, it can present certain obstacles as it relates to organizing and um, just getting certain things done. So uh, we have not as of yet participated in the uh, year of purpose events, but that is something that we have definitely had a discussion about and would like to contribute to as we move forward. And you can find um, the list of those events on the Black Lives Matter School uh, webpage. I'll um, put that in the chat also. And just to add to that, yeah, we did. And the um, Anthony and I are on the national um, committee that's talking about, um, there, there's been a national committee for K-12 and we're just initiating a committee for higher ed right now. Um, and we have a meeting coming up on October 28th um, after I stop talking, I'll see if I can find that link and add it here as well. Um, but one, I wanted to speak to Natalia's question um, or statement. Um, and I think that's so much of what we are currently reckoning with on our campus right now. Um, and I, I yesterday posted something on my Facebook wall that um, was in response to the, the Inside Higher Ed um, article that I posted earlier in the chat um, that asks, how can you do Black Lives Matter work without Black Lives? Um, and it's been really like spinning in my head about the ways in which anyone that knows me well knows that I'm, um, you know, want to get up to the mic at union meetings, want to talk at faculty senate, want to raise the discussion um, to a point where we're talking about how oppression works within our policy and practices. And one of the things that I am so accustomed to doing as a white woman in, in academia is making a space and filling it. And so one of the things that, that I'm personally thinking about, and I can just speak from my own perspective right now, but as a white accomplice and co-conspirator, I'm thinking deeply about how is it I'm creating space and then not immediately filling it. Um, and that's one thing that I think um, white folks and especially white women really need to reckon with. So I didn't answer your question exactly, but we have to keep talking about it. Thank you for raising that here, Natalia. Um, there's another question that I'd like to raise that was sent to me um, that I think is really a, a really nice one, especially looking at, we have about 12 more minutes left before you all head out. Um, and that is what tips or next steps would you suggest if your institution that has been told by students of color that they do not feel safe or supported on campus and faculty of color do not feel safe or supported and action is not being taken. So what tips or next steps would you suggest if you were in an institution like that? See, it's hard, it's hard to speak for other people because at the end of the day, I mean, when, when you start talking about bringing about social change, it's going to be risk associated with that stuff. Right, right. And I, and again, I, I don't want to romanticize this stuff. Um, and there will be choices to, that need to be made, right? So, I mean, how important, I don't want, I don't want to put it in this way, but you know, how important is it to you? Um, and you, as, as individuals and institutions, you need, you need to weigh out those risks and just organize at the end of the day, right? Um, if, if people see other individuals um, doing the work, 
then that might also, it's, it's just like in the classroom, right? You know, if you have one person raise a hand, that, that might actually um, spur other individuals to raise their hand as well, right? So if somebody starts to do the work, um, you might be able to get other individuals to come on board with respect to um, uh, uh, contributing to that work and taking those risks with you. I think there's also something to be said for strategizing, um, especially if you're in what might be termed, I, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouths, but a quote unquote hostile uh, environment to sort of anti-racist work and or where there's, you know, whether, whether there's, you know, serious pushback or whether there's a complacency, those things are a little different. So depending on the kind of environment that it seems like it is, I mean, the thought of how do you then find, first of all, other, other key stakeholders. And I, like Anthony's talking about, you know, kind of organizing, finding folks that you trust um, to have sort of these kinds of conversations and then figuring out you know, what is, the, what is the next move that feels right? Um, is it to start like, you know, I, there's different levels of comfort is the other part. So there's different levels of risk and that also attributes to the comfort level and how comfortable do you wanna be? It depends also, I would say, I, I think a lot of times people get a lot of criticism for not being uncomfortable. I think uncomfortable is, doesn't matter which conversation you're having, you're gonna be uncomfortable. So. I think sometimes we get a little bit too judgy about like how uncomfortable did you actually make yourself there? I think there's also a whole lot of risk that you need to assess and to say, what's my position at this university? How secure is my job? I gotta feed my family, right? But also to say that this is super important. And so how do I go about it? So do you start with maybe having a panel discussion, having a round table discussion, bring it up in your department first, or do you start by saying, you know what? No, I, we are ready for a rally. We are ready for a socially distanced rally and to have people come together and, and show support in a, in a physical way, despite you know, COVID and keeping you know, distanced and masked is important, but we need to be there physically. So I think it's gonna involve the key stakeholders and, and making that decision as a, as a group. Um, and again, only you knowing what your campus climate is really like um, and figuring out that balance I would say between the risk and the importance and what's going to be impactful. You don't wanna have a panel discussion just to have a panel discussion, right? And so there's, there's a lot of things to weigh, but the thing is that you're not gonna do it alone. And so that's the, I think for me is always the key. Sometimes I take on some of this work and I think like, well, what am I doing? What am I doing? And I get stuck in like the individual and realizing this is, this is all of us together. And if we are doing it together and we're not alone in the decision-making, we're not alone in the action steps, um, then it becomes more manageable. And, and it also diffuses a little bit of the risk, doesn't it? So in some ways, depending on the approach um, and how much you individually are putting yourself out there, you, if you can weigh that and figure out what steps are still meaningful, right, still impactful, but weighing those other concerns, I think is just the reality and is just um, something to think about. I guess I just want to follow up on that. Oh, Anthony, you're muted and I'm talking over you. <laughs> um, uh, follow up on that with like my own personal experience of sitting through like many webinars over the summer about anti-racism and what does that look like? What I, um, I heard repeatedly were calls from black women to speak up in the moment. Um, and that, you know, we've heard the phrase white silence is violence, but really taking that to heart um, and, mm -hmm. and also calls to live with the discomfort um, and to take risks, right? And, and that, that's the type of thing that, and that, you know, this is kind of what Carolyn was just saying, but just from my personal experience of doing this every day, even preparing for this presentation, you know, challenging myself constantly, like, are we, um, am I doing everything I can do right now? Am I, am I staying in my truth? Am I staying grounded? Am I aware of my own white fragility um, and different reactions? And, and how can I stay focused on the, the goal of this work, which is to support Black lives? Um, on my campus. 
Um, there was another question about staff who are not part of the faculty, right? Um, so staff members or other folks on campus and how they're involved in um, Black Lives Matter at school activities and in which ways they are. Um, so how have folks that are not faculty and not students um, participated in our events and in our organization? Um, I really haven't seen too much of um, staff just, well, no, you know what? My mistake, because I'm actually thinking about um, some of the workers on campus, but no, there have been uh, a variety of different contributions from individuals that are staff that are not teachers and um, also not students. Um, even Jennifer, well, I mean, Jennifer, you do teach a class, don't you? Librarians are faculty in SUNY, but okay, I, am gotcha. not, I am not teaching faculty, I am library faculty. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So um, um, there have been some contributions from um, other non-teaching faculty members, um, but as it relates to, the first thing that came to my mind was just even like some of the workers on campus right, that uh, work in the um, cafeteria and different things like that, whether or not they have been engaged. I have mentioned some uh, throughout, the, throughout the last year. I've been at, uh, I'm going to my third year here at SUNY New Paltz. I've mentioned some of these um, events to workers that I've be, uh, developed relationships with, but I have not seen anybody um, participate in our events. And we have, I can't say that we have made a, um, uh, partic uh, particularly significant effort in as it relates to getting them involved. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Um, Kirsten, you have anything else you would like to add to that? Um, no, I think I, there were a couple of people. Yeah, I think you captured it well. Um, and definitely the of the people that were involved about almost a year ago, um, it is definitely faculty heavy at this point. We have seen. Um, nutrition rate for sure and i think this is kind of like what we were talking about earlier with like how the summer really shifted things for us right this came out of a critical pedagogy like group right so it really was very classroom focused but now we're having these broader discussions about what it means to be an anti-racist campus um and and we are trying to be responsive to the continued murder of black people so you know absolutely like expanding the coalition on campus is a very important next step for us and one of the um you know victories eh, right, right. Uh, a a issue that we were able to engage is that um uh, in a discussion that we were having with respect to issues of racism on campus, um, we were able to get the campus to make a commitment to putting on its website a commitment to becoming an anti-racist campus, right? So you have that as well, right? Um, and I just put that, uh, put a link to that there in the um, in the chat as well. So you know, you know these small things can add up. You know, now as it relates to, is that more um, symbolism than substance? Uh, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> that's a whole different discussion, right? right? But it's important. These small things are meaningful, right? These are meaningful, and they can help to, you know, just galvanize support in a variety of different ways. We are living in a particularly unique uh, um, moment right now, just as it relates to understanding the different ways in which we have had national protests around issues of racism in America, right? And I would like to say, well, I. I there will some people's circumstances will be more challenging than others but in some sense i would like to say and i don't like to speak in absolutes but if not now then when and i, I want to go back to a thing natalia put in the chat again um when she said um in higher ed and many other professions white people do not notice when we're not there um, speaking of, of people of color on campuses. And I think that that statement, right, that, like we have to do better and, and white folks especially need to do their own education. Um, we have a conversation, a weekly conversation happening in the, our School of Education right now. Um, and people are really grappling with, with how do we make sense of the fact that teacher preparation in many ways has been um, keeping racism just as it is. Um, it's really in the fabric of what we do in classrooms. Um, so doing that education being open to constantly reframing um, your own paradigm and then being vigilant on a daily basis. Um, 
about this work, but we could go on. Yeah, one of the tips um, or actions that I was told a few years ago and that I thought was like really powerful and personally actionable was particularly about professional conferences like this and making a choice as a white person about whether or not I'm gonna participate in a program um, that may not have people of color. Uh, in the program at all, right? And so when do I make a choice um, to maybe sacrifice a professional opportunity to make a statement and say, you know what, like I see that diverse, like this program isn't really representing a diversity of views and I don't feel comfortable participating in that. And in, in addition to that, I just wanna be clear. I mean, because also, and it, this is just because there are a lot of different extremes and poles, right? And I see that we're about to wrap this up, but sometimes you will engage black people to get involved and black people don't wanna work with white folks. That's important, right? right? That's important, right? That's a phenomenon that's going on at New Pace, at New Pulse, not, you know, not everybody, right? But that is a reality that has to be engaged when you start talking about organizing around these things. And is um, I think that in some sense, you need to be open to being respectful of those choices that those individuals make, individuals make. And uh, one thing I was gonna add to Natalia's question about our faculty, staff and student um, breakdown in terms of race. I wish I could share it now, but it's gonna be too crazy and we're at the end here. But um, some stats I had from that continuing the conversation um, panel that I, I run each semester, um, I have some stats from 2017 that comes from um, the iPads and the EFA data sets. And basically the gist is that uh, we have about two thirds of our undergrads are white and about um, 18 to 20% are considered uh, Latinx. And then there's smaller breakdowns from there of Asian, black, um, and other, uh, you know, ethnicity unknown, quote unquote, and other um, for that data set. And then for faculty, it's about um, 82, 83% um, white, and this is as of 2017. Um, and then the breakdowns go from there, it's very similarly to the ones for students. And so we are, you know, one thing that we've been talking about in our group is there is no playbook on how to create a Black Lives Matter at school group at a, at a PWI, at a predominantly white institution. And so we're sort of figuring out how to do that um, as we go. Um, I know we're, we're out of time. And so uh, we wanted to just say thank you to everybody for uh, having us today and for engaging in this conversation with all of us. Um, and please do um, feel free to keep in touch with us. And um, when we send along the slides to uh, Chris Price, we'll also include our email addresses and uh, contact information. Um, and also you'll see at the very end, there's this slide that has some links for you all too um, that you should check out if you're interested. So thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Wow, what a fantastic panel. Jennifer, Anthony, Kirsten, Carolyn, I appreciate it. I appreciate your perspective, all the work you're doing. I tweeted out that I thought someone had a comment earlier. You're not just talking about this, you're doing it, you're acting. And so this is you know, really refreshing to hear. And, um, and it sounds like you're inspiring other campuses to do similar work. So uh, just really quickly, I wanna say that, you know we've been trying to sort of uh, spark conversations across SUNY around diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And we recently sort of uh, are piloting a workplace group that's um, just to have conversations like this uh, in a very confidential, safe space. Uh, and it's actually, you can't find it in a workplace. We're trying to sort of make sure that, you know, again, we keep it safe and we don't have it just open and free for all. So, but if you're interested in that, I'm gonna put my email address in here. Uh, let me know and I will get you in there. And, um, you know, we have a lot of good people. Some of them are here today that were helping to facilitate that conversation. The other thing too, is that um, I'm going to put in here the Twitter uh, handle if you want to tweet. Uh, it's SUNYFACDEVCON20. And so uh, if we want to continue the conversation, we could do that there. Um, and someone was asking uh, about the recordings. All the recordings will be put on the website that we use for the conference. And Jennifer put the link in the chat there. So I'm going to actually stop the recording now.